Say something? Test. Test. Oh. Wrong frequency. We're good? Okay. All right. I get to so am I, uh, I'm not on a mic for everybody, right? No. Okay. Yeah, Just I got to project loudly. Yeah. Well, here we go. Okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So... You guys don't go there. All right. All right, so let me ask a quick question here. How many of you think flexibility is important? How many of you spend time within your practice working on flexibility? All right. Come on, okay. be honest. All right. Johnny, this is our fifth rowing talk. Johnny has been here four out of the five. We had last year, we had his assistant, Andrew Locks here. He was great. But Johnny's, Johnny is so instrumental in not only the successes we've had with rowing, but also all our programs. And it's, it, it, as I've seen him grow, I've seen us grow. He works, he's our trainer for all, all our, when I say trainer, I mean fitness trainer. Uh, he's the director of our, well, give me the title. I'm the head strength and conditioning coach for all of our 17 sports, and then I run our fitness center as well. Right. And we have three, we have three strength and conditioning coaches on staff, which for a Division three is very rare, wouldn't you say? Oh, pretty much unheard of. Yeah. Right, right. And what Johnny does, we, we let him, we're blessed to have him work with us. 
and it's amazing what he's done. So he's going to talk about his thing right now, and I just want to say thank you for coming. You're very busy, and I really appreciate it. Thanks. You're on. Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about joint mobility in rowers. Um, so I, I started here uh, speaking five years ago now, and I actually took last week a moment to go back through YouTube and actually look at the old presentations that I did. And I was thinking to myself, why did you do that? Why, why did you teach that? Uh, and I think that's, that's more along the mindset is that strength and conditioning um, is just ever changing every year. You know, some, re some research comes out, it's published, and all of a sudden that research right when it's published is obsolete because something else came out. Um, so now strength and conditioning is no longer about the scientific research that comes out after two years of trying to get it published. It's about the blogs, the websites of highly you know, knowledgeable strength and conditioning coaches. So um, this, is kind of, this, this idea spawned um, during a, a talk that I heard two years ago by Fred Holmbein. Um, he was talking about ankle mobility in rowers. And he was saying how there's this correlation between a person's ankle mobility and basically the optimal angle that they can get in the boat for their leg drive. It's going to make it more efficient, having ankle mobility. Well, I've been kind of thinking about that a lot lately this year, considering I've been watching a lot of our lady rowers, and we've been doing a ton of ankle mobility. So a lot of balancing, a lot of working on, on that posterior, that anterior movement, those sorts of things. But at the same time, I'm not seeing the flexibility that I want to see just off of that ankle mobility. Uh, I'm going to use Miles as an example. Fred talked about if you're able to sit like that with your heels flat on the ground comfortably, that's good ankle mobility. But we're having, we're having some difficulty with a lot of our rowers doing that. So I wanted to talk about how our frame of mind is now and, and where we're going to be moving towards to the future and kind of where strength and conditioning is going as well. So what's the secret? What's the secret? Everybody asks me, you know, what's the secret to strength training rowers? Muscle isolation, supersets, flexibility, circuit training is always a big word, body weight exercises, power training, mobility, CrossFit has come into the conversation recently. The secret is if I can shape and I can mold all of these and kind of create what I want to create, that's what strength and conditioning is all about. It's not just about one thing. And that's the thing we got to start changing a little bit. Some people are sold on CrossFit. And that's great, but that's not the end-all, be-all of what we're about and how we're going to improve our rowers. Where strength and conditioning is heading. So there's two separate approaches that are currently going on. We have the movement approach, where you're looking at three different planes of motion. You have frontal plane, which is basically side-to-side -side movements, A, B, A, D, ductors. Okay, you have sagittal plane, straight up, straight down, squats, those types of things. Okay, then we have transverse plane. It's more rotation of our trunk, okay? So we have th these three different planes. This is where we get the concept of sports specific, okay? F focusing on strength training in your planes of motion, right? So if, if I'm a baseball player and I'm throwing, okay, that's more of a transverse plane. So I'm going to work on a lot of anti-rotational chops and things like that, okay? If I'm a rower and I'm in the sagittal plane a lot, I'm going to do a ton of squats, a ton of lunges, all of these things. All right, so that's the movement approach, basing the movement of your sport on the conditioning of your sport. That's great. That's great in a, in a, lot, of, in a lot of ways. Now, there's another one coming out, and it's, it's been pushed by uh, Mike Boyle. Uh, he is the strength and conditioning coach for the Boston Red Sox. He's also the strength and conditioning coach for the USA women's uh, ice hockey team. And he's, uh, he also runs uh, men's fitness number one gym in the nation. So he does, a, he does a lot of things. So his joint by joint approach is always talking about mobile, stable, mobile, stable, mobile, stable. Now what does that mean? We're going to start down at the bottom. So your ankles, naturally they're mobile. Okay? Your knees are stable. They're more of a hinge joint. They just move straight up, straight down. If, you go, if they go side to side, we're in trouble. You have your hips which are mobile, okay? Lumbar, stable. Thoracic, T-spine, mobile. Shoulders, stable, okay? A lot of people may think that shoulders are mobile. Well, 
In a sense, yes, but you have to make sure that they're stable in order to control that rotator cuff, do all those things around that shoulder joint. Okay, so that's the idea. Mobile, stable, mobile, stable. Dysfunctions. Dysfunctions in our human body. So if an ankle loses mobility, if we sprain an ankle, it's going to travel up. So now our knee is going to suffer. Basketball players, they sprain an ankle, they tape it, they brace it, they do all of those things. You know what happens? They get jumper's knee. So they get all this pain in their patella. Okay? Hip loses mobility. Lumbar suffers. Okay? T-spine loses mobility. Shoulders suffer. Great example. How many of you have heard of the L5-S1? It's the common injury in rowers. Common injury in rowers in terms of their lumbar spine. So if their hips lose mobility, they're going to end up with that problem. Okay? T-spine loses mobilities. This happens in pitchers. Tommy John surgery, all of those things. They lose the mobility in their thoracic spine. So they start using their shoulder a lot more. What happens? Their shoulder falls apart. Okay? So that's the dysfunction, that's the dysfunction, dysfunction of it. Okay? Rowers, L5, S1. So if you look, if you look at the L5, S1 issue, we're looking at a hip issue. Ankles are great, they need to be flexible. Works, our way, uh, works ourselves all the way up. Okay, so if we're looking at a rower, and he slide, he, they, they come all the way down into the slide, and their tail shoots out beforehand, now you're going to put a lot of pressure on that lumbar spine. Okay, at the finish, if you're overextending your back, that's going to put a lot of pressure on your lumbar spine. So technique is going to become that much more important. Increased ankle and hip mobility for rowers. Okay. Greater flexibility down the slide. Optimal leg angle coming into the catch. Greater overall lumbar, lumbar spine stability. We need to focus on that stability. Less likely to shoot your tail. Less likely to overextend the back at the finish. What to do? What to do? Now this is, this is where we kind of get, in, get into it a little bit. Okay, so proper warm-up. We use foam rollers. So we have a couple of different ways to foam roll. We're going to start out. I'm going to have Ashley and Val show you a little bit. Uh, I want you guys to show me that TFL, so right in that side. So they're going to work on their TFL inside of their hip a little bit. And this is all myofascial release type of stuff. So if their hips are really tight, okay, we're trying to loosen up that front section of their hip. Very small little roll, about 30 seconds. By the way, these foam rollers cost anywhere between five and eighteen dollars depending on the size of them. Mike has a bunch at the boathouse. Um, you know, and he, he has like the quarter one, so if you cut that into quarters, uh, they're great. We, we need to focus on a proper warm-up before we get into the boat. Okay, so we have the TFL. Now let's switch over to the glutes. So you're gonna, they're gonna sit on that foam roller, they're gonna bring up that one leg on top of the other, and they're gonna lean to that one side with the leg up, and then they're gonna roll out that one glute. Okay, it's really important that we get the front and we get the back. Okay? So we have glutes. Then we want to get the IT bands, the iliotibial band that leads from the hip all the way down to the knee. So they're going to work on that IT band. Once again, once again, doing a lot of sagittal plane movements, doing a lot of sagittal plane movements, hips will get really tight. They'll tighten all up, so we need to make sure that we're getting everything loose. So we have the IT bands. Once they finish on the IT bands, okay, then we're going to get the T-spine, the thoracic spine, because that's going to play a little bit into our mobility. So they're going to cross their arms, so they're, they're touching their shoulder blades, get down to their T-spine. It's going to be above their lumbar. We don't want to foam roll the lumbar, because that's going to cause us to go into overextension. So they're foam rolling that thoracic spine to get themselves loose. And then, final, we have the lats. Lats, obviously big muscles that run down behind your arms, extremely important for rowers, but they are extremely overactive. Okay? So meaning they're always tight. We have to stretch them. We cannot let our lats get tight on us too, too often, because okay? that's going to cause more overuse in our back and less use of our legs, which is what we want. 
which is where, where all of our force is. Okay, so we have, um, I'm going to have Ashley come up, and I want you to show me an overhead dowel squat. So that overhead squat. So we do a lot of these. We also call them prisoner squats if you don't have a dowel. And if you look, very good positioning with her back. Very good ankle stability, very good hip mobility there. Everything straight up and down. Okay, nice job. And then I want you to show me um, that sumo squat hold. So go ahead and put it down. And then remember, it's, you're going to squat all the way down and then push your elbows out from your knees. And then put your hand. Yep. So she, what she's doing now, we call, it a little, we call it a sumo squat. It's different types of squat holds. Once again, working on that mobility of the hips. What she's doing is she's taking her elbows, pushing against her knees, so it's giving some of that ABA deduction. Once again, great ankle, ankle flexibility. Now, not everyone will be able to get into this position right away. It's going to take time. It's going to take progress. It's going to take lots of stretching. Like I said, hip, hamstring, quad stretches. Static stretches are fine. They're important. Okay? So go ahead and stand up. Thanks. Um, also, you want to focus on unilateral versus bilateral exercises. We think two legs, but we really want to focus single arm, single leg versus two leg, two arm. Right? Why is that? Because we always have a tendency to compensate for one leg rather than the other. So it's really important that we focus on stabilization, on mobility of one hip while another leg's elevated, or vice versa. Okay? So that's going to play huge importance in your, in your training programs, not to just stick with the bilateral squats okay, before you row, because that's, that's just overuse. That's too much. Okay? Uh, supine versus prone exercises. Supine, meaning stomach. Your stomach's facing down. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, uh, you're on your back. Supine meaning you're on your back. Prone exercises. Prone exercises, you're facing downward. Okay, so with these two, you want to focus on only prone exercises. How many, how many of you have done leg lifts when you were younger? Like leg lifts, flutter kicks, you know, all that stuff? Pretty much everybody, right? What happens when you're laying flat on your back and you're doing those flutter kicks, you're going to compensate. You're not going to use your core. You're actually going to use your hips for those. So now what's happening to those hips? They're tightening up. They're tightening up. So when we get into the boat, after doing a whole core segment of leg lifts, flutter kicks, that kind of stuff, everything is going to be tight. So for our mobility, it, we won't be able to get down into that slide the way we want to. We won't be able to have that drive the way we want to. We're going to get more force applied to the back, all of those things. So what should we do instead? Planks, lots of variations of planks. Ladies, get down into a plank for me. What this does, it really focuses on stabilizing the lumbar spine, activating your glutes, and you can do so many variations of these. Spread your feet out and just raise one arm, don't roll the hips. So you're like, you got Val doing a bird dog over here with a leg and an arm up, you know, and you got Ashley doing one, one arm, okay? Now just alternate feet. So they're just bringing one up, they're focusing on activating their glutes, not dropping their back, okay? So if you think about that, if their glutes are strong, if their glutes are strong, they won't overextend their back. Okay? If their iliacus and psoas in the front are strong, right, that, that means you won't have flexion in that lumbar spine, so you won't be, be dropping that way. All right, go ahead and stand up. How are we doing? Okay, every athlete is different. Val DeLisi versus Ashley Miles. Okay, so I want you each to grab a dowel. And I want you to face this way, okay, but I want you to line up. Come this way. I want you right here. Okay, right there. Yep. Face that way. There you go. Hands above the head. Okay. Now I want both of you to do an overhead squat. Go ahead. Hold it, Val. Go lower. There you go. What do you see? You see overactive lats, heavy extension in the back. She is killing this section right now. She's killing it, all right? And that's because she doesn't have the hip mobility to get down lower like Ashley, all right? Stand up for a sec. So if you look, height difference is huge. Height difference is huge here, okay? But they're two of the best rowers. And the reason why Ashley is good is because she has, 
She's Gumby. She's very flexible. She's able to have a lot of length. She's able to have a lot of length in the boat. You know, for Val, you know what my prescription for her is this month? Go to yoga twice a week. We need to get that hip mobility going, okay? So, key takeaways. Key takeaways from this. All rowers need a proper warm-up protocol. Don't be sucked into fads. I can't stress that enough. Don't be sucked into this CrossFit fad. Don't be sucked into the superset fad. Don't be sucked into any of these fads, okay? Shape your model off of everything, okay? Get the right, get the right mindset, get the right research, okay? Stress proper technique. I can't stress that enough. I have athletes coming from all different backgrounds and teams and strength coaches, and I need to get them on the same page as me, okay? Recognize and stop poor performance, okay? Am I going to continue to have Val do that? No, I'm going to stress to her that we need to get this sorted out. We need to get her to have better hip mobility. She's going to be that much better of a rower this season because of it, okay? You need as much strength as you do mobility, okay? Great. Lunges are great. All of these things are great, but we need mobility. We need flexibility. We need mobility. Then we can start teaching the heavy strength lifts like power cleans, front squats, those types of things, you know, but always think mobility first. This is kind of our outline of what we do for their strength training during the year. So September for me, it's all instruction and development. I got to see where our freshmen lie. I got to see where our novices lie, see what their mobility is like. So we're going to work. We're going to basically work from the ground up. I see two girls back there, Bird and Crystal, and they're always like, Coach, we need to get going. Come on, we need to, we need to start working harder. I'm like, no, just calm yourself down. We got a long way to go. We got a long way to go. October, November, December, February through mid-March, that is when we build our strength. Build our strength, build our strength, build our strength. Okay? Mobility is obviously thrown in there. Okay? Mid-March is when I want us to hit, hit our peak strength levels in the gym. Okay, because that's not necessarily going to benefit us in May when we're going to the national championship. What's going to benefit them is the best times on the earth. Okay, mid-March through mid-April, we deload. We go higher load, low volume. We promote power. Okay, power meaning more body weight exercises in an explosive fashion. Okay, mid-April, increase mobility, increase flexibility protocols, lighter weights, short circuits, Promoting muscular endurance, May, national championships. Okay? That's it. Whoa. That's awesome. Yeah. So, Johnny, how about this? Could, uh, the, the common response, and I used to say too, I don't have time yeah. before practice. I got to go. I don't have time. We do a, a set warm-up before practice. Could you just maybe take one minute and just... Tell, show them what we do before practice. Sure. So we always start off with some sort of dynamic warm-up. So we'll start off with um, whether it just be front lunges, uh, back lunges with a twist, because we're starting to get that little bit of T-spine mobility in there too. We'll go a little. Uh, we'll get some transverse movement. So go ahead and just do a front lunge with a twist. So they'll just do a simple twist to their back leg, or they'll do a simple small little twist, that kind of stuff. Um, we'll do a lot of hip mobility drills. So a quick one, walking they do. Pull up the knee and go to the quad stretch. So they'll just pull up, get that glute a little bit, and they'll get that quad. And we'll just do this walking so they're actively doing it. We'll do a little bit of calf stretches too because calves play into a huge role. If they're nice and flexible, they play a huge role into the ankle mobility segment. So we'll do some walking calves. We'll do some uh, inchworms. Remember those, inch your feet all the way up to your hands. There you go. So we'll do some inchworms like that. Um, those types of things. Um, then we'll start to get into the more mobility for the hips. Uh, we'll do those sumo squats, pushing the elbows out. Uh, we'll do a lot of foam rolling before as well. Um, but our main, our main thing is this guy. Like trigger points, we use lacrosse balls, we use foam rollers. Lacrosse balls we can use for the lats, you can use baseballs, you can use anything. I actually was just in Target yesterday and they're starting to make massage little just hard, hard balls to, to work out because myofascial release is becoming such a big component of pretty much any strength and conditioning. So, so we spend how much time before practice in, in, with the flexibility of our warm-up? 
10, 10 to 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but that's going to that's going to change based on the, wh where they are in the year. So like when they're getting closer to April, uh, March, April, May, we're going to be doing a lot more flexibility. And so Gaz Valen asked, do you find it productive use of time to do that warm up before we go out of the road? They're, yeah, they're, they're, say, they're saying yes because they can. They're saying yes because they can. You know, obviously they all want to get moving. They all want to get. You know, we do all of our workouts in the morning, so they're, you know, they're they're itching to get the day started and get going. Um, and we only have an hour, so we tr we try to we try to fit all of all of those components into that hour as much as we can. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? No. No. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll say after. Yeah. So uh, four minutes, and then we'll our last speaker, and then.